like we're live. Um, thanks everyone for joining us tonight on this incredibly beautiful evening. Perfect for thinking about gardening, I have to say. Um, tonight we will be talking about planting your first native garden. We are recording this, so we'll be sending out a follow-up email to everybody. Uh, so don't worry if you miss anything. There's going to be all kinds of tips tonight. Um, also in the follow-up email, we're going to have some attachments um, that Jackie's also recorded or uh, put together for us. So, uh, so look out for those. Uh, we have... We'll have Jackie talking to us. Um, oh, it looks like Angela actually put down in the chat uh, the handout as well. So if you want to get that in advance of the email, you can also take a look at it there and download it. Um, we have Jackie talking tonight until around 645. And at the end, for about 15 minutes or so, we'll do Q&A. Take it from there. Um, so put your questions in now. But again, everything's going to wait until the end for Q&A. So just, be, just hang tight on that. Um, we're also going to post the recording on Facebook and on our website at chicagobungalow.org. So look out for that. Um, coming up and our next webinar is April 17th, Building Permit Basics. And then on May 6th, we have Protecting Your Property for the Future. So you can find those on our website as well. Just go again to chicagobungalow.org for that. Uh, we also have our bungalow garden contest will be starting in June. So check out, uh, you can go to our main page for that also, uh, uh, our, also we're going to send out emails about that. So if you're on our email list anyway, you'll be getting information. So, you know, when to sign up for the bungalow garden contest this year, uh, I think that's all of our announcements. So I would love to introduce Jackie Rippus, who many of you know, as you've seen her give many webinars for us over the years. Uh, Jackie Rippus was born and raised in the South Suburbs, where she and Larry raised their two kids. She found quite by accident that gardening was relaxing and that digging in the dirt was her happy place. Along the way, she founded Prairie Godmothers, a service-based hands-on company that created sustainable home landscapes and touted the benefits of greener living by demonstrating how to save the planet in easy-peasy ways. Jackie put Prairie Godmothers to bed a few years ago, but continues to help out when a call comes in. Jackie's a master gardener and volunteer in the Leary Garden in Chicago. Uh, she recently retired and Jackie serves on local boards and commissions and spends time in her art studio. She has a long history with the Chicago Bungalow Association and she's happy for the opportunity to work with our members. Uh, thanks, Jackie. Uh, whenever you are ready, want to pop on the screen. Um, we are ready for you. You can hear me, correct? We can hear you, yeah. Okay. We can't see you yet, but we can hear you. You cannot start, let's see. Okay, here we go. Yeah. All right, there you are. Well, it's, uh, <laughs> you can see, well, it says you can't start your video because the host has stopped it. What does that mean? Hmm. I don't know, but we can see you. So you're good to go. Yes, I can see you. But you can't see the presentation. Right. Um, so Angela, I believe, is pulling up the presentation. Yep. As the great there we go. Okay. Okay. All right. There we go. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad to be with you all tonight. Some of you have seen me before. Um, I have a, a, a long standing relationship with the bungalow folks, and I'm glad to be here. I am a 40 year gardener, and I've been a master gardener for 25 of those 40 years. And really, what that means is I had 15 years to really make a lot of mistakes. So I not only show you how to do things the right way, but I know from experience because I've done so many things the wrong way. Today, we're going to talk about planting your first native garden. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, send them on and I'll try to get them answered for you. But this is uh, something a little different for bungalow owners um, and those in historic homes to bring natives back to your landscape. Next slide. Uh, there I am. I am in my favorite garden, uh, fa favorite community, uh, public garden. That's the Lurie Garden in Millennium Park. And as I said, I, I uh, love, it is my happy place. And I'm going to be glad to tell you about gardening uh, with natives. Next one. Here's what you need to walk away with today. Three things. Number one, bringing natives to your garden, you're making a, a real big difference. Um, I want you to know that you're contributing to the growth of a healthy, vibrant, thriving ecosystem, because when you add natives to your landscape, you're inviting native birds, butterflies, and other insects 
to find nourishment and safety in a space, especially for them and their offspring. You'll be providing nectar and pollen needed for agriculture and berries and seeds for birds migrating to and from points north and south. Plus, you'll be providing an outdoor botany lab for your friends and neighbors. That's your first takeaway. You're making a difference. The second takeaway is that like any garden, a bit of planning and preparation goes a long way to give you the desired result that is within your budget. And then finally, the third takeaway is that new gardens, any new gardens, native or not, need a few years to get comfortable and patience is the key. Next. What's a native, you ask? Well, a native plant is one that has occurred naturally and is, has existed for hundreds of years in an area. The plants can be trees, flowers, grasses, or anything else that grows. Um, I consider myself indigenous to the Midwest. Uh, a native uh, can, like, like me, it originated here. It can withstand seasonal changes. It's not always the most showy in the garden, but it can always be counted on to show up. Natives have extensive root systems that absorb, that absorb moisture and nutrients, filter water, and improve soil. Perennials are plants that come back year after year after year. They're not considered indigenous or native to the area, but they grow along peacefully next to native plants. And the point here is um, you, can, you can mix and match. You can put in a native plant and often there is a perennial sister or brother that goes just fine in the garden. So uh, this is uh, to let you know there's so many options when you want to provide uh, natives in your garden. Next. This is a graphic you're looking at, 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 at of an ecosystem. And this is really the only time I kind of stand on a soapbox. An ecosystem is a big organic family where plants, animals, and other organisms work together and depend on each other to survive. It's not just about living things, but also about the air, the water, the soil, and sunlight that make up the home for the plants and animals and for us as well. Everything in an ecosystem is connected like a puzzle. And when one part changes, it can affect the whole system. And without a balanced and diverse ecosystem, we can lose green space, disrupt natural plant habitats, increase invasive species, lose native bird and insect species, affect clean air and water, all which disrupt this delicate balance. Balance ensures that the resilience and stability of our ecosystem is better able to withstand disturbances like climate change, invasive species, and habitat destruction. It's also as simple as you might be noticing that some of your flowers are blooming earlier this season than ever before, or perhaps later this season than you might have noticed. And, and when something blooms earlier or later, it disrupts uh, when the birds are looking for food and when bees and butterflies and other bugs are looking. So it's a really uh, delicate balance that we're looking to do. I refer to Doug Tallamy a lot. He's a professor on the East Coast. He says to us, as gardeners and stewards of our land, we have never been so empowered to help save biodiversity from extinction. And the need to do so has never been so great. All we need to do is plant native plants. So when I tell you that you're making a difference, even in a small way, you have to believe me on that because you are. Next. I know that Carla liked this slide because I, um, I put a lot of uh, bugs on this and uh, Carla is a bug studier. But when we plant native native when we plant native varieties, we introduce and invite beneficial beads, birds, and butterflies to the yard. And of course, these beneficials work hard to keep our ecosystem in balance. Pollinators are like nature's little helpers. Uh, as I explained to the little boy across the street, Beckett, I said, um, bees, butterflies, and birds, and many other insects help flowers and vegetables grow by moving pollen from one flower to another. So it's not just bees, butterflies, and birds, but we look forward to bats, beetles, flies, moths, ants, wasps, and even the wind can 
uh, help us uh, pollinate things around our garden. About three quarters of all flowering plants and a third of the world's food supply are pollinated by insects. <clears throat> Next one. <clears throat> so now you know why we want to do this. Let me talk to you a little bit about how you get started. Uh, the first thing you'll want to do is um, understand the space that you're going to be planting in, whether it's the front of your home, the back of your home, along the garage, between the two houses. You're going to want to know uh, what you're working with so that you can pick the right kind of plants. So whether it's a new garden or you're adding to an existing place, get up close and personal with your property. And here's, here's how you do that. The first thing is to pay attention to water retention. Give it the 24 hour test. After it rains, walk around the house and see where the areas are slow to drain, maybe a little bit muddy, where it holds water for 24 hours or so. Um, and if it holds water where you want to plant, that's a signal to you, brand new gardener, that you need plants that thrive in damp spaces. And there are a handful of flowers like turtlehead, columbine, coneflower that love what we call wet feet. If the area drains well and stays moist or kind of moves to the dry side, you have many other choices as well. Native of plants adapt to our conditions and can handle temperature and climate extremes much better than non-natives. So uh, the important thing here is understand the space where you want to put your new garden and make sure you know what kind of uh, water uh, it needs. The second thing is sun exposure. I've made it real simple here because plant tags can get very confusing. A plant that needs full sun needs six hours of sunlight. A plant that needs part sun um, is three to six hours of sunlight, a little bit less. And one that wants part shade is indirect sun. So if, if uh, it doesn't get full sun and it, there's big trees in the area or buildings or it's on the side of the house and a little sun pops through here and there, that's what we call part shade. So you'll want to understand what that is as well. And then finally, um, I can save you a lot of time by just telling you that your soil is mostly clay with occasional sand. And what we want to do as we prepare a garden bed um, uh, is to make sure that we put the right kind of amendments in there to make sure that uh, it can sustain plant growth. Once you figure out where the water is on your property and how long it stands, once you figure out the sun exposure, um, you're ready to uh, start to select plants for your native garden. So do this one time, write it all down and file it under how to save money in your garden. Because if you understand these three things, water, sun, and soil, you will select the right plant for the right location. If any of you have ever gone to the local nursery and brought home a plant that's absolutely lovely and got home and wondered what you did, needed to do with it, that's because you don't really have a place to put it. And we want to make sure that what you buy goes into a place in your garden. Next one. Once you know uh, the profile of your garden, you're going to do a couple of things to start to create that new garden. If you're just going to add native plants to an existing space, uh, that's very easy for you to do to find the spot and put the plant in. But if you're creating something new, you have to first mark off the space. It's good to visualize it for a number of reasons. Um, mostly because the size of your garden will run you between 15 and $20 a square foot for materials. Materials are plants, soil amendments, and mulch. And it doesn't count for labor because I'm presuming the hard labor is going to come from the homeowner. If you have to hire out to do it, you can triple those numbers. So mark off your space with an extension cord, a hose, a rope, kind of just lay it out to see uh, how you want the space to look. And that will give you the ability to visualize things. If you don't have an extension cord, a hose, or a rope, use tennis balls or uh, you know, pine cones or anything you can find that will help you visualize what the space should look like. 
Uh, before you dig, I think in Chicago, you contact Digger at 811. Uh, that's because if you're gonna go down six to 12 inches, you should have the city mark the spot just to make sure you're not hitting an underground line. The next thing you need to do if you wanna garden this season is to remove the existing vegetation. You have to get rid of the, the turf or the sod. Uh, you have to pull the weeds out. You have to uh, get rid of rocks and maybe some clay that'll be there. Uh, this is the hard part of starting a new garden, but it's, it's easy to do. It's easier to do if you would have thought about this last year, because I could have given you tips and time savers uh, to make sure you can kill the turf without having to dig it up, but that's a whole nother presentation when we talk about lasagna gardening. But for now, uh, borrow a sod kicker or a sod cutter um, or by hand, cut that sod out and um, take a look at what your, what your soil is made of. And that's by testing for tilth. Tilth uh, tells you that you, what the combination of soil, or excuse me, loam, sand and clay are. And you just give it um, a test. If you take the soil and squeeze it in your hand, if it stays into a ball and then crumbles easily, you've got it made. You have just the right amount of loam, sand, and clay. If it has too much clay and it doesn't crumble, um, that's a sign that there's not enough breathing space in your soil for your plants. And if you squeeze and it falls apart, that's also just as bad a sign uh, that it won't help your plants thrive because it doesn't have the nutrients it needs. So to get it just right, what I have done is add three or four inches of compost to my to a new garden. I have purchased bags of mushroom compost and I mix it uh, with my own combination combination of shredded newspaper. For those of you that still get newspapers, you can run it through a shredder and um, the Sunday Tribune is about the amount of shredded uh, paper I use when I wanna mix up my soil. So to get it ready, you're gonna test it to see if you need to add amendments. And 99.9% .9 of the time, the answer is yes, you're gonna have to add some compost to it. I did mention mushroom compost, but there's other compost that you can use. You can use um, dry horse manure, you can use chicken, uh, chicken compost, which is actually chicken poop that is bagged up. There are a number of things you can find at your garden center. You're gonna mix that in and then you're gonna turn the soil with a, a spade or a shovel. Uh, you're gonna turn it six inches or so, so that we know we, we're starting with um, a really good spot to start to plant your natives. Next one. Uh, these are the things that as a gardener, I'm gonna share with you. If you have a garden friend, uh, we all have our secrets and, um, and we might also tell you, uh, if you ask a question, we might give you four different answers to the same question and we'll probably all be right because gardening, as you know, is really personal. But here are some things to consider when you get ready for your garden. Uh, find inspiration in public gardens. So walk through the Lurie Garden, walk uh, the Bloomingdale Trail, walk through the Morton Arboretum, uh, the public gardens along the, the lakeshore. Uh, you'll find inspiration in public gardens and you might even find inspiration at the garden down the block. So look around to see what plant combinations you like, what gardens make you feel good and so on. Uh, books and magazines are, especially this time of year, are very helpful as well. The second thing is to get to know your plants. When you know your plants, you're better equipped to take care of them. The right plant in the right location is your key. If I walk through my garden, I might not always remember the name of the plant, but I can always tell you that that plant is there because of the amount of water and sunlight that plant uh, needs and how big that plant gets. So you wanna get as familiar with your plants as you possibly can. The next thing is to keep your garden size manageable, especially new gardeners or people who are starting new gardens. Start small. Um, anything under 20 square feet is a good start. 20 square feet doesn't sound big, 
but for new gardens or even experienced gardeners, it is pretty big. So keep it manageable. The next tip is to select five or fewer varieties of plants. Don't go crazy and get one of everything so you have 20, 20 different kinds of plants to put in your garden. You want five or fewer. Um, you're gonna limit the varieties, but not necessarily the quantities. Uh, birds and bugs are often attracted by color or species. So you're gonna plant in drifts of the same color or the same species. Don't mix and match. If you want to attract um, wildlife to your backyard, uh, they're attracted to the same kind of flower or the same color uh, in a garden. This one, this next one, buying plugs instead of seeds is key for me. I am not a good gardener when planting from seed. And in fact, if I wanted anything to go in my garden now, I would have had to start the seeds two months ago. A plug is just a small plant. Uh, we gardeners call them plugs, native gardeners call them plugs. So buy plugs instead of seeds uh, to give your garden a head start. And if you're really um, concerned about and not sure of yourself, there are also kits that you can buy for, for native gardens. Um, and it gives you a jump start. So there are a number of nurseries online and magazines that will sell you native gardens in small kits. Uh, the next one is to plant in favorable weather. And, and this is key for me. You can start preparing your garden bed now here in late spring once the weather gets closer to the 50s and the soil is moist, but not soaked. It's always easier to pull stuff out when the soil is a little bit wet, as I did this afternoon, pulling out some weeds in my garden, but you don't want it squishy. I prefer to plant when the weather is more consistent and it hits the 60s for at least five consecutive days. So as we get lulled into thinking spring is here and the nurseries fill up with plants, uh, this is when we get very excited about garden, gardening, but, um, I think it's time to get the garden bed ready, but not to buy any plants just yet. Uh, and then finally, you wanna make sure that you water the plants daily uh, a little bit uh, for the first couple months uh, to get the plants started. And then I finally use mulch to not only pretty up the garden, but to uh, protect the natives and their roots. It's a sure way to keep uh, weeds out and um, I use natural mulches, uh, whether it's uh, uh, mulched wood, you can use uh, grass clippings, you can use mulch leaves, any number of things that are organic uh, that will uh, give the garden a nice look, a nice neat and tidy look and protect the plants as well. Next one. So after I've said all that, I, I, can, I can hear a panic that you don't know where to get these darn native plants. And so the bungalow uh, group came to the rescue for the eighth year in a row, they have a list where you can buy quality native plants around Chicago, way north, way south, way east, and even some that are west. I live in suburban Flossmoor, so I'm south, and we are not too far from the home of a premier native nursery called Possibility Place. And if you go to many of the sales of native plants that are on, on this link that you can go to on the bungalow website, you're gonna find that many of the plants were grown south here um, in Moni at Possibility Place. So um, you're gonna click on this on their website and you'll find exactly what you're looking for. And the bungalow uh, group solved your problem. Next one. Um, here's a couple ways to get started if you're not exactly sure what you want to plant. Um, invite butterflies um, into your garden, butterflies and moths and dragonflies. Give them a place to eat and lay their eggs. You've probably heard that we have diminishing species of monarch butterflies for the reasons I described early on in this presentation, but we can invite them back to our yards by giving them a place to eat and a place to lay their eggs. So there are a number of um, 
kinds of milkweeds that you can buy uh, that are pictured here, swamp milkweed, butterfly weed, and common milkweed. But I also throw in dill and parsley to round out a butterfly garden. They love, uh, they love these herbs. Dill uh, will reseed and come back year after year in your garden space. And uh, parsley sometimes reseeds, but you may need to plant it yearly. Milkweed loves to move about the garden as well. So give them a special place in the back of the garden or a sunny corner near your garage. Next one. This is my butterfly garden. It, uh, it's not what it looks like right now, but it looks, it's what it looked like last summer. You're gonna see common milkweed, black-eyed Susans, autumn joy sedum, mountain mint, anise hyssop, and coneflowers. And as you can see, my plants are in drifts. Um, the coneflowers are toward the back. The very, very tall ones to the right of the picture are my milkweeds. I have, I have a number of things there, but large drifts that are very attractive to uh, the wildlife that I want to bring to this spot. Next one. One of the things that if you have a butterfly garden, you're going to want to do is have a puddling, uh, puddling pool. You uh, want a place where butterflies can rest and relax and even drink a little. So you can place it on the ground, a shallow dish, fill it with sand, some pebbles, and some water to create a butterfly puddle. And that helps uh, the butterflies rest and hydrate. And this is just another example of a beautiful butterfly garden that has milkweed, yarrow, and pale foam flower. Next one. If a butterfly garden is not your thing, or you don't feel like you have uh, the sun requirement, they need full, full to partial sun. I think there's a number of, of natives you can invite into the garden that um, grow tall from 18 to 30 inches, and they make a perfect addition to a fence line, or if you wanna hide some trash bins, or if you wanna put something along the side of your garage, or if you wanna add a few flowers to the front of your house in your native garden. These are all natives, they do well together and they bloom at different times throughout the summer and fall. They're good to put behind shorter plants because they give your landscape a colorful pop. And if you select two or threes, it's an e two or three of these, it's an easy way to get your garden started. Turtle head on the top left, left will bloom mid to very late season. And if you look very closely when you grow it, it looks like the, the bloom looks like a little head of a turtle, which is where it got its name. Cardinal flower is one of the few reds that you get in the garden, very attractive to dragonflies and uh, bees, and they come along midsummer. The one on the far right is hyssop or agastache is the, the botanic name. It's one of my favorites, this particular purple hyssop. It smells like anise or licorice, um, and it's just one of my favorites, and it's very attractive. It stands nice and tall for a very long time in the garden. The bottom left is a great blue lobelia. It has a shorter blue time, but it's one of the sapphire, only sapphire blues you're going to find in your garden, and um, it's a good attractor for pollinators as well. Goldenrod uh, likes to move about. Uh, it's a beautiful pop of yellow in the garden. And while I love it in my garden, I watch it closely because I don't want it to overtake. It, it can be a little bossy sometimes, but it, it really is a great pollinator as well. And then finally, the last one is a blazing star or liatris. Again, um, good to put in an existing garden or put to the back of a garden, perhaps along a fence line, as you will see in the next picture. Next. So here's two fence lines. Uh, the one on the left is uh, has some of the tall plants I just mentioned, as well as some butterfly weed. And the one on the right has uh, the goldenrod, as well as the blazing star uh, growing in there, and some hyssop as well. So those are uh, kind of wiry, wild and free kind of plants. They are pretty sturdy and they'll stand up straight. Um, and they're 
really preferred by um, lots of small birds because as the flowers dry out, the birds can perch on the top of the points of those plants uh, to get some little seeds. Next one. If you have a damp or a wet location, here's a few more natives that you can look for. The, uh, these plants, again, all do well together. Um, you very rarely, very rarely see yellow natives in a wet area. So the marsh marigold, it's low growing, um, but it's a, a great one to add, especially if you're thinking of uh, creating a rain garden. And if you are thinking of creating a rain garden, which is a whole different seminar as well, uh, the Bungalow Association has a number of vis videos and tips and time savers on creating rain gardens that use native plants. So a marsh marigold is one of them, and you can get extra tips from, from their website. Uh, Menarda is another one of, um, uh, is preferred by bees, and it's another uh, plant that grows very nicely in the garden. Um, you might have heard it called bee balm. Um, you also might have, uh, if you drink bergamot tea, the leaves from the Monarda or bee balm create bergamot tea, and you can dry the leaves from a Monarda and uh, steep them in extra hot water. The one on the top right is columbine. Columbine is easy to grow. It reseeds easily. It moves about the garden um, and brings a really airy look to spaces. So if you ever have an empty space in your garden, you can be sure if you plant a columbine, it'll sure to fill that space up. Uh, the one on the bottom left is a New England aster. It's a fall bloomer. It's quite colorful. It can get really leggy. So uh, if you're planting it, you're gonna wanna plant something in front of it to hide the dry legs it gets come October. And one of those things you can plant in front of it is the plant next to it, the Pennsylvania sedge. A sedge is like a grass, uh, but tends to be a little sharper. We say that sedges have edges. And if you run your finger along uh, along the, the piece of the, the sedge, you'll feel it'll, it'll kind of uh, sting your fingers a little bit. Um, and then finally, Queen of the Prairie is a favorite of mine. She's a beautiful pink. She can grow to about five feet tall. Perfect for a rain garden, especially if it's in the back of the rain garden. Next one. This is an example of uh, a rain garden that one of your bungalow owners had in her back in their backyard. It's along a fence line where the, the house drained uh, very low from the house to the garage. And so we planted a number of plants that I have mentioned in this, in this presentation um, so that the water is absorbed before it goes back into the water table. And of course, you have some really beautiful flowers that not only serve a purpose because they can handle these wet conditions, uh, they'll thrive when the garden gets a little bit dry. And of course, it's just beautiful to look at as well. Next one. So if any of this has caused you to hesitate just a little bit, uh, maybe a garden is not your thing this season or you're not very sure, consider adding a shrub to your garden space that produces fruits for migrating birds. You might not be familiar with some of these plants, but they would be beautiful statement pieces somewhere in your front or in your yard. And they are sure to um, invite natives to your yard. For example, the first one is a spice bush. At its mature height, it's 10 feet, uh, or excuse me, 12 feet high by 15 feet wide. But as we gardeners know, we can keep those sizes in control by um, pruning them every several years. The spice bush shrub loves wet feet. It thrives in shade as well, although it doesn't mind sun. And it is a host plant for a swallowtail butterfly. The next one is a chokeberry. It grows 10 by 10. It also loves feet, wet feet. It thrives in sun and in shade. And I can attest that um, 
The berries that are on the chokeberry are just as deep blue as you see in that picture. That's because the berries taste terrible and it's the tree that keeps the most berries on through the fall season until the birds have no place else to go to get berries but the chokeberry and then they'll, they'll eat them. They don't taste all that great, but they're a lovely addition that attracts uh, finches and blue jays and cardinals and um, um, other sparrows that fly around my yard. The next one on the far right on the top is a bayberry. Bayberries uh, grow 10 by 10, but I have them in my yard and I keep them uh, They measuring at three feet. So they're, they're lower um, airy shrubs and uh, the little uh, bloom that's on that, the little flower is actually what's used to scent bayberry candles. So um, mine are in sun. They don't mind uh, wet feet, but they also don't mind dry. They do well in all conditions. So this would be something, again, along a fence line or perhaps under a uh, picture window or something in the front of your house. The next one is a black currant. And again, the, the bees, or the butterfly, excuse me, the birds love these things. Um, it grows um, kind of small, five feet by six feet, five feet high, six feet wide. And it's another one that kind of likes it moist, but it would handle a dry uh, yard as well. The next one is a coral berry. Uh, this is a native that is uh, indigenous to this area, but they're not always easy to find because they can be a little bit finicky when we start to grow them from, um, you know, from seeds. So a coral berry is good in all conditions and it grows four by four, which is kind of just perfect. And then the last one is another that I have in my own yard. It's called a button bush. For those of you uh, that are decades and decades and decades old, like I am, you might remember what Sputnik is. It was a, a, a Russian uh, space uh, spaceship, if you will, that kind of looked like that. So we refer to the button bush seed as um, a Sputnik seed. It can thrive in standing water. And it's what I call a very nice screen. You can put it in front of a window. It won't block the window, but it won't allow anyone to look in either. It's just a, a really nice, beautiful uh, flower like that that comes around uh, late spring to early summer. So if you're concerned about not wanting to take the giant step to do your first native garden, um, consider um, uh, just a shrub to get yourself started. Next one. How time flies when we're having fun. So in closing, I wanna leave you with a few things. Uh, first of all, um, in the information that the Bungalow Associ Association will send out to you, my phone number and my email are there. I don't, um, I don't garden except for myself these days, having you know two, two uh, mechanical hips and a mechanical knee kind of, um, I don't hop up as fast as I used to, but I am always, always glad to answer questions. Uh, to take picture, you can take pictures and send them to me. We can, you know, walk through your yard with a Zoom or something. I'm always glad to answer questions if you don't know where to go. But finally, you are making a difference when you add natives to your backyard. They bring balance, much needed balance, to our delicate ecosystem. I hope you learned a little bit about planting and planning. You have to know your space, pick your spot. And when you know your space and you pick your spot and you know your plants, you're gonna get results, the results you're looking for. And then finally, you have to be patient. What we know about gardening and plants, any kind of gardening and plants is the first year the plants sleep, the second year they creep, and the third year they leap. Native plants are on a little bit of different time schedule. They, they tend to grow very well the first season and then maybe take off the second season, but you have to be patient. And then as your plants mature, you will start to see seasonal changes in your yard. And there's gonna be daily things you'll see when you see your first butterfly or honeybee 
or dragonfly, it, it's mark it in your calendar because there's more that will come. And it'll just show you that you've done a really great job to keep inviting nature to our backyards. And with that, we're done. Next one. There's my email address. There's my phone number. I do have a, a Prairie Godmother's Facebook page, but um, glad glad to help you on your journey if you need the help. And with that, Carla, I'm going to turn it to you to see if anyone has any questions for our next uh, 12 minutes. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Jackie. Um, yeah, we've got about 15 minutes for questions. Um, I saw a bee yesterday, by the way, for the first uh -huh. time. So that was very exciting. Um, and I do love your bug slide. Thank you for including that. You're welcome. <laughs> I'd also like to say, if there were no bugs on this planet within 50 years, all life on this planet would be gone. So yes, That's you're very, very important. Um, really true. It's how, it's how we... It's that ecosystem. I mean, it's just, it's so very delicate that. I know it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, oh, wait, I had one more question. Bergamot, that's, it's basically Earl Grey, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Just want to make sure. Okay. Now other people's questions, we can finally get to. <laughs> um, okay. Um, which is Menarda, which is Bee Bomb. Yeah. What's that? Well, Menarda, Bee Bomb, Earl Grey, Bergamot, all the same. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, Maria wanted to know um, what plants don't interfere with your plumbing. She's asking if boxwoods would be one. Uh, plants, trees that generally plants don't interfere with your plumbing. Shrubs and trees, however, have a tendency to do that. So if you want to plant anything that has deep roots like a shrub, um, uh, boxwoods, because they don't grow all that big, I would put them three feet away from the house. They don't have they don't have deep roots, Maria. So I wouldn't worry so much about that. It's it's when you get into um, uh, you know the larger story trees, oaks and maples and things like that. You don't want to put uh, anything that might have deep roots closer than five feet from the house. But boxwoods are good. Hydrangeas are good. Um, evergreens are fine. Um, it's just the the tall storied trees are are generally not good. Right, those roots really go. Um, uh, oops, just get, get kicked down every time somebody adds, so I lose my spot. Sorry. Um, uh, could you please tell us the kind of plants that are good? For I'm sorry. Good for what? I lost you for a second. For uh, plants that are good for wet areas. For wet areas, absolutely. Um, I would say um, if it's if it's a wet area, I can tell you I can tell you what I grow, and I grow um, marsh marigolds. It's on it's it's on one of the slides. It's on page sixteen. Marsh marigolds, bee balm or monarda, um, New England asters, turtle head. Um, a lot of uh, uh, pale coneflower uh, will grow pretty well also. And don't be afraid to mix that with perennials um, that don't mind wet feet either. So there you go. Those are, those are just some. And you know what? I have these really great cheat sheets that um, talk about you know, different things, different plants that like it wet. Um, I would advise you either to reach out to me directly for a whole list or go to uh, possibilityplace.com. That's the nursery that supplies all the native plants to all the sales that you're going to go to this fall, this spring, and they can point out specifically to you what will grow best in, in wet conditions. But right. these guys will do fine. These guys will do fine. It, you know, and, and just to show you how versatile... The plants are, I have swamp milkweed, which likes wet feet, and it's planted in a very dry area of my house and it does just fine. Right. Um, I know you also talked about um, amending the soil, mm -hmm. uh, but just because people miss things too. Um, what's a good soil amendment material for native plants? Uh, the same thing you would use for perennial plants and that would be um, any organic mixture like, um, uh, cow manure, uh, chicken compost, mushroom compost, and don't be afraid to shred your newspaper 
not the colorful pieces, but your newspaper, your uh, envelopes from your mail, put it in a paper shredder and that will decompose quickly as well. And they, they um, add some tilth and some sturdiness to the soil. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you don't wanna spend any money, you can consider grass clippings. You can mulch this fall's leaves as you clean through your garden. Um, some coffee grounds do really well in the soil. You take the compost in your backyard compost bin and toss it around and work that in as well. Cheap and cheerful. Cheap and cheerful, yes. Um, uh, another Maria, uh, if you're out and about and it's October and you see some dry flowers, how would you know if you should borrow the dry flower petals to plant in your garden uh, versus its bulb? Is that uh, well, it's part of knowing your plants. It's part of knowing your plants. So if you see flowers drying in the fall, probably what's in the pod or the seed head is what can get planted. Um, if you see flowers that bloom in the spring, like, um, you know, many of the flowers that are blooming now are bulbs because they were planted last fall. So we're talking hydrangeas, daffodils, tulips, um, things like that. Um, but again, as I said, I'm not, I'm not fond of planting from seed because I'm not very good at it. And that's why I suggest <laughs> plugs for, for that way, you know what you're buying and you know where you're going to put it. Great. Um, we have a few people who are interested. Um, they wanted to know more about planting in drifts. Okay. Planting in a drift is planting the same plant um, in, 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 a, in a specific area. So if I were planting a butterfly garden, I would, let's say I'll have three plants. I'll have turtle head, I'll have coneflower, and um, I'll have uh, hyssop. I'm going to buy seven plants of each because we gardeners, I don't know who invented this, but we buy in uneven numbers. It's supposed to be uh, better for the eye. So I'm gonna plant my seven um, turtle heads um, in an area, you know, that maybe covers a couple feet. And then next to that, or behind that, or just the side of that, I'm gonna put the second variety and then I'm somewhere around there, I'm gonna put the third variety. So what you will see when they are full grown is three separate areas or drifts of plants. And we like to do that because uh, bees especially, honeybees especially are attracted to color. So if it can be the same, if I can have pink turtle head and um, they'll go that way and then they might be attracted to the other plants. So it's just a, it's just a, a, you can call it whatever you want. I call it a drift. Some people call it a carpet. I just call it a bunch of the same plant in the, in a, an area. I hope that helps. Yeah, so, um, okay. Kind of just going to the ones where there seem to be a lot of people who are interested in these questions. Um, is there anything toxic to pets? I thought I remembered that chokeberry is unsafe for dogs. Uh, somebody also mentioned, and he also said sumac he's concerned about as well. Um, I, you know what? I have to look on sumac because sometimes it could be the, the berry of a plant. So I'll have to look that up and I will get back to you. Um, I don't, um, the choke, black chokeberry to my knowledge and my research is not uh, a problem for pets. I can eat them. They're terrible, but I can eat them. <laughs> um, I can tell you that um, cocoa hull bean compost smells like chocolate, is yeah. toxic in large amounts to dogs. But I'll look up that sumac. I don't know. And I'll get, I'll get an answer to that. Uh, Maureen also... Oops, sorry. Uh, Maureen also commented on that saying um, she just looked it up and from the shrub side, it seems only spice bush and black currant are safe for dogs. The others seem to be toxic. So um curious about that. Well, you know what? I'll, I'll look that up too. I, I've mm -hmm. never been asked that question, but, but when I research, when I've researched on the site that I go to, it's never indicated a problem, but maybe I've learned something. We'll just confirm it. Okay. I'll go to the source. I'll go to my native uh, plantsman and ask. Great. 
Um, and then we have a question, other, a few other people wanted, uh, just moved and might not make this season. Any resources for planting for next year, specifically resetting what's there now? Example, lasagna gardening. Oh, <laughs> lasagna gardening. Maybe, maybe we need to do that in the fall, Carla. Lasagna yeah. gardening is a way to create or expand an existing garden space. And it's the lazy man's way to prepare a garden. It is just layering compostable materials over the top of the turf or the top of the grass. So it's layering um, brown and green ingredients, uh, straw, um, cut grass, mulch, compost. You know, there's any number of different layers you can put um, and you let them sit all winter. And by the time spring comes around, you're ready to plant. That's all you have to do. So. Um, that that's something you can do in preparation uh, this fall and preparation for next year. It's also a good idea to uh, just get familiar with your property. So, you know, um, you know, you don't want to spin your wheels, spin your wheels, looking at things that might not work. So mm -hmm. if you don't want to do it now, investigate what your property is all about. And we'll talk about lasagna garden. That's fun. Yeah, that's fun. I didn't know that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a couple people wanted to know if they need to kill their garden if it's overrun by violets. Uh, if the garden if the garden is overrun by violets, they they run underground. They have runners, and um, the surefire way to get rid of violets if they're in your grass is really to smother the grass out. I I don't often use pesticides. Um, but there are ways to just get rid of all that. If they're creeping through your garden, um, you're going to pull them out, but it's, it's going to be an ongoing battle if they're in your garden spaces and you just have to stay on top of it or kind of learn to live with it. Um, what is a good method to design the garden for all seasons? You have to do your homework. Yeah, I was going to say, homework. go back at all of our old webinars too. <laughs> you have to do your yeah. homework. So here where I live, I know that um, in the spring, I like to have color and those are bulbs and those are daffodils, very rarely tulips because rabbits like tulips. So if you walk through my yard right now, you would see the starts of all of my plants and shrubs coming, but you would see, um, you would see uh, uh, daffodils growing. And then I have my summer and uh, fall months and then I leave everything standing over the winter because the top of the cone flowers are um, food for uh, migrating birds and finches and things like that. So um, I, I, I do a lot, I've, I've done this for a lot of years. I've made a lot of mistakes. So I think it, I, I would just encourage people to start small and um, then add on over time. Okay. Isn't anyone asking about cicadas? Nobody. I know. I was looking for that too. <laughs> I've not seen one yet. Um, we are, we, we have one about dragonfly specific plants or plants that moths love, but nothing about cicadas. Well, dragonflies and moths. If a butterfly likes it or a, a bee likes it, a dragonfly or a moth will like it. And and um, there's an old wise tale that says if you see dragonflies in your garden, that it's a sign that it's a very healthy garden. And um, I didn't always see dragonflies and I do now. So I want to believe that wife's tale. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. If you attract, if you're attracting butterflies, you'll be attracting moths as well. Um, and um, cicadas, you know, we're, we have two cycles coming in here in the South suburbs. It's incredibly loud. We have, we have trees that are, you know, a hundred years old and, and they love that. I did plant a new tree last October. And right now it's covered in netting because it's a brand new tree. And I don't want cicadas digging into that. If it's not a brand new tree, uh, I don't worry about it. You put netting around it. Interesting. Okay. Like how far up the tree do you put the netting? Oh, well, it's, it's just a five foot tree uh, because it was planted last year. Oh, so just over the whole. Completely. Okay. In yep. okay. Interesting. Yeah. I haven't seen that. So, yep. um, uh, Ah, somebody did say cicadas cover. Well, as you were talking, yes. So <laughs> now we have a bunch of cicadas. Too late, guys. Too late. Um, yep. 
couple of people wanted to know how far apart you should plant uh, pint-sized plugs. Well, I'm really big on what I call the pack and stack method. I like to crowd my plants together because it looks good the first season and it kind of keeps weed growth at bay. Um, and I tend to use that same mentality when I'm planting plugs, but um, I would say, I would say if the native gives you an instruction on how far, far to plant them, I would follow that instruction because they will tend to grow a little bit better and a little bit faster and you don't want to be moving them your second year. So I would follow I would follow the instructions on a native tag more than I would on a perennial or an annual tag. Okay. Uh, we'll take a couple more. Um, and then uh, Jackie, are you okay if we uh, send you some of these afterwards Absolutely. like usual and sure. we'll answer yep. those? So don't worry if we don't get to your question tonight. I just wanted to get to the ones where we had multiple people asking the same yep. thing. Um, are there any good rodent deterrents besides uh, certain herbs? Uh, a bit of a big one, but yeah. Well, are we talking city rodents like rats and things like Probably, that? Probably, I would guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, squirrels and I, rats. I, well, for squirrels, um, I tend to um, sprinkle cayenne pepper. I get a, I get a big jar or two every year. I sprinkle cayenne pepper in my bird seed. It doesn't affect the birds, but the squirrels don't like it. And when I plant bulbs in the fall, I generally put um, a nice little coat of cayenne pepper on top of that. And that seems to keep them at bay. Mm -hmm. If I don't want them nibbling at my plants during the garden season, I do have a squirrel feeder at the other end of my yard. So I try to deter them from where my plants are and, and put them at another end. Um, I don't know, um, I don't know about, um, you know, uh, rats. I, I do know that in one of the gardens I planted in the city, we used cardboard as um, the bottom layer of our garden. And what I didn't know is that uh, rats love to crawl under cardboard. And so, oh, interesting. so, the, so they had a, um, a rat problem coming from the alley. So we had to fix that. Yeah. But, yeah. So I, and I don't, um, I don't use pesticides, but I don't have those kind of city things. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I did have, um, I did have uh, field mice and things like that. And we had to call an exterminator to be real honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. We had a, I had a giant garden. Um, I live in Ukrainian village and it was like whack-a-mole. All the rats would just go terrible. <laughs> so yeah. So yeah, I mean, you we can never plant, really solved that one. I just moved. So yeah, you can plant <laughs> things that they don't they don't like smelly things, onions and mm. uh, you know that kind of stuff. Um, but I, I, again, you have to you have to know what you're working with. And and often, um, if you put in something like a bar of soap, um, like mm. um, the, one of those deodorant soaps, like oh, I don't I don't even coast or something like that. Um, that scent will sometimes uh, send them away. I've experimented with soap. I've experimented with coyote urine, with, um, you know, urine of all kinds of sorts. <laughs> and they're always smarter than me, so. Yeah, you know. um, better you than, than us experimenting with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'll take one more, uh, just because I, I, this one comes up a lot. And when you talk about everything, gardening. So um, some gardeners advocate a no-till method, which does not amend the soil and avoids disturbing the in insect ecosystem. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, I said it earlier. If you ask four gardeners the same question, they're going to give you four different answers. Mm -hmm. And in my gardens, I, um, I like to till because that ensures me that I can, um, I can pull the clay out if I run into patches of clay and I can amend it with the kind of cocktail that I like to see. I can also tell you that as I was weeding today in those very same gardens, um, I found myriad uh, worms in the garden, which is always a good sign of the health of the soil. So that's my opinion and my perspective. Um, other gardeners feel differently about it. Yeah. Okay. 
All right. Well, Jackie, thank you so much. Again, um, we're going to send, you know, send the, rem the remaining questions over to Jackie and she's going to go through them for y'all because she's amazing. And we'll include those in the email that's going to go out probably at some point next week, um, along with uh, that, uh, those sheets that Jackie yep. also sent over, um, Angela posted earlier. So we're going to have all kinds of good information for you guys in the follow-up. Also a link to this, which you can also find on our website um, and on our Facebook page. So uh, along with Jackie's previous webinars, if you want to go and search through as well to see like, how do you plant, you know, during other seasons? Cause I know some of y'all are interested in that as well. So Jackie, thank you again. Always so good to have you back. Um, and we'll, I'm sure see you again soon. Thank you. Happy gardening to everyone. Thanks so much. Yes. All right. Good night. Bye now.